Great. I think uh, Sir Harry doesn't need an introduction because, you know, um, we organized this webinar series, in fact, is to celebrate his retirement. So all of us here would know who he is. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Sir Harry to present his talk. We've had an excellent lecture by Roger, uh, which emphasized the connection between quantitative modeling and structural characterization. And it's really important to understand that quantitative models, uh, which are physically based, cannot be developed unless you understand atomic mechanisms uh, of transformation. Now, uh, my talk today is about carbides, and people often ask the question, uh, how can we possibly get carbide precipitation by a displacive mechanism when the chemical composition, uh, for example, of cementite is 25 atomic percent of carbon uh, compared with the much lower concentration in the steel? Well, um, we are all familiar with displacive transformations, which are controlled by the rate at which carbon partitions. So, for example, we take it for granted that Wiedmann-Stad and ferrite forms by a displacive transformation mechanism, but controlled at a rate by which carbon advances in the austenite ahead of the interface. And just to show you that it's a displacive transformation, if you polish a surface organically flat, uh, you will see uh, invariant plane strain deformations due to the formation of Wiedmann-Stad and ferrite. So uh, Jack Christian, uh, back in the early 60s, pointed out that some elements which are in interstitial sites because they are small, for example, hydrogen and carbon, they can actually dis diffuse while the substitutional lattice is displaced into its new crystal structure. So this isn't just applicable to steels, that you can get a displacive transformation uh, where the substitutional atoms move in a disciplined manner, whereas the interstitial atoms are able to partition. Uh, in the case of uh, zirconium hydride, for example, Cassidy and Weyman showed a long time ago that there is a, a, a perfect invariant plane strain shape deformation accompanying the hydride formation, even though the chemical composition of the hydride itself is much richer in hydrogen than the rest of the uh, zirconium and similarly vanadium hydride. And both of these transformations fit exactly in the concept of para-equilibrium displacive transformations. They fit perfectly with the crystallographic theory of martensite. So if we turn to carbides uh, and imagine that this is our parent lattice, whether it's austenite or ferrite, and we have excess carbon in that lattice, it's possible to get the substitutional lattice into a different arrangement of atoms while carbon partitions. So look, we have developed a carbon depleted region here, uh, which if I had plotted a concentration profile across this interface, you would see a depleted region here. And as the carbon partitions more, you get a displacive growth of the carbide. So the interstitial elements, which are small, as Jack Christian pointed out, they do not affect the crystallography of the transformation, the mechanism by which the large atoms move. So turning now to the iron carbon uh, phase diagram, uh, we normally look at it up to the cementite limit of 6.67 weight percent of carbon. But in fact, you know, if you keep on pumping carbon into iron, then you will get this two phase field of theta plus chi carbide, and then eventually the the cementite disappears and we end up with just chi carbide and eta carbide. So these carbides form when the carbon concentrations are very high, but you can get them as transition carbides because cementite uh, can be difficult to nucleate. So when we temper low carbon martensite, for example, we can go through a series of precipitation reactions in which those carbides which are easier to nucleate form first and eventually are replaced by cementite in the tempering sequence. Now, the temperatures at which we temper martensite, uh, ignoring secondary hardening for the moment, are simply too low to allow substitutional atom diffusion or iron atom diffusion. So here we are considering just the iron carbon 
system. And in order to get a transformation in which you don't have strain energy uh, or minimize strain energy, you would need the ion atoms to diffuse to accomplish the structural change. Now, many years ago, uh, Omori and uh, uh, others looked at high resolution transmission electron microscopy of cementite and they discovered transformations within the cementite. So here, for example, you've got chi carbide, thin regions of chi carbide. Chi has a monoclinic uh, crystal structure and a slightly different uh, carbon composition than cementite, which has an orthorhombic crystal structure. And these chi precipitates, uh, uh, in, in fact, the re reaction is reversible, but these chi precipitates are forming by a displacive mechanism rather like stacking folds in austenite, which represent three layer thick regions of uh, the HCP form of iron. So this is a displacive transformation mechanism, even though the carbon concentration is different because carbon is able to move at the temperatures where we form, uh, form these carbides. And notice also that uh, these are very, very thin plates. And that is a, a characteristic of displacive transformation. It's not a it's not a sufficient characteristic to indicate that it is um, a displacive transformation, as you will see later. But if it is displacive, you must have a thin plate shape. So cementite, which forms at high temperatures, has a shape which is more or less uh, spheroidal. Okay, uh, and people think of perlite as plates, but they're not actually plates at all. Uh, they they have a very complicated shape which undulates a lot. So perlite forms by a diffusional mechanism. This is the sort of cementite that we get when we form particles at a low temperature where iron atoms cannot diffuse. So this is a strong indication, uh, not a sufficient indication, but a strong indication that the transformation is displacive to cementite. Now, what is the fundamental condition for a displacive transformation? Uh, in order to have an interface which can cause the atoms to move in a disciplined manner, you must have one line in that interface, which is at least one line in the interface, which is completely coherent between the parent and product lattices. Otherwise, you will require diffusion in order to get transformation. So what that means is that if you imagine that the parent crystal is deformed into the product, then the eigenvalues of that deformation must be like this. That means one of the eigenvalues must be one. In other words, you leave that particular eigenvector completely undistorted and unrotated. And this uh, has to be greater than one, and the, uh, sorry, um, this has to be less than one, and this has to be greater than one. So this condition comes about from the requirement that the interface can glide without uh, the non-conservative transfer of atoms. Now, how can we decide whether a carbide can actually or, uh, form by this mechanism? How do we calculate these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Well, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, we routinely measure orientation relationships, and, you know, they are published widely even though the information may not actually be used because they're so easy to measure. Although uh, it's not easy to measure these orientation relationships with the precision that is required, as I will show you later. We also need to have a uh, knowledge of the crystal structures of the parent and the product phases and some indication of the shape of the precipitate so that we know that we are in, on the right track. So how do we actually calculate these values given an orientation relationship and crystal structures? Well, here is the classic relationship between austenite and ferrite. People call it uh, Kojimov Sachs or Nishiyama Wasserman, but neither of those are accurate descriptions. The real orientation relationship is irrational, but close to uh, having these close packed or most closely packed planes parallel and flows back directions within those planes roughly parallel. So this is relatively easy to determine experimentally, the orientation between the ferrite and the austenite. Uh, 
and we can express that as a coordinate transformation matrix or a rotation matrix if the two crystal structures are identical. So we have an orientation relationship which you can measure using uh, transmission electron microscopy most commonly. What you then need to think about is what sort of a deformation can change that parent lattice into the product. So imagine that this is our austenite lattice. Inside that, we can identify a body-centered tetragonal lattice. And if we compress along this direction and expand along these two directions, that will change into body-centered cubic. And there is something called a correspondence matrix, which says that, look, uh, this particular vector of the austenite, which is a 110 type vector, becomes a 100 type vector of the ferrite. It's not saying what is the relationship between the final and, pro, uh, final and uh, initial vectors. It's simply saying that this vector changes into this. And that's why it's a very simple matrix that the 001 direction here is common to both the austenite and ferrite whereas these two directions, it's the 110 of the austenite, which is parallel to the 100 of the ferrite. So this is called a correspondence matrix, and you identify it simply by looking at the crystal structures. Now, this correspondence matrix is not unique, but as you will see later, uh, the, you will be able to decide on what is the right correspondence matrix by working out the eigenvalues and choosing the minimum uh, distortions that lead you uh, from the parent to the product lattice. So in the case of austenite to ferrite, that has been shown repeatedly to be the Bain strain, which is, which is this, that you simply compress along here and expand along these two axes, and these are the principal distortions. Okay, so we've got the orientation relationship and we've got the uh, correspondence matrix, uh, that's the orientation relationship. And the deformation required to take the austenite into the product lattice, you can get from your experimentally measured orientation relationship and your guessed correspondence matrix. So this is actually a physical deformation, which includes both uh, a pure deformation in which you know, the principal axes are not rotated and also a rotation, a rigid body rotation. And then, it's very easy from this to work out the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of the deformation. And in the case of the austenite to ferrite transformation, it's possible to find an invariant line. And that's why Martin Siddick transformation is possible. So let's now go to the more difficult problem of uh, forming cementite by a displacive transformation mechanism. Uh, and the first uh, complexity is, of course, that the unit cell of cementite is autorhombic with uh, 16 atoms in it. And there are measured orientation relationships already in the literature. Uh, this is the so-called Bagariatsky orientation relationship, and this is the Izaichev orientation. Now, although the Bagariatsky orientation is used widely in the literature, uh, it actually doesn't exist, as was shown by Zhang, uh, Zhang and Kelly many years ago because most of the measurements done do not have the precision. You know, they're simple electron diffraction or EBSD and so on, but simply do not have the accuracy. If you do these measurements using uh, transmission electron microscopy and the right techniques, you can show that this actually doesn't exist. And this, which is a, a deviation from this orientation, is the correct description when cementite forms during a tempering reaction or during the bainite transformation. Now, it's very interesting, actually, because I did an analysis in which uh, I demonstrated, first of all, that the Bagariatsky orientation does not lead to an invariant line, okay? because none of the distortion, there's no line left uh, undistorted and unrotated. But if I then multiply this matrix by the rotation that would change Bagariasku into Izachev, then I recover the invariant line. Okay? So this is the line that is necessary 
in order for the transformation to be displacive. And as Pat Kelly and uh, Chang pointed out, the Bagariaski doesn't uh, exist because it doesn't lead to any invariant line. So if you correct the Bagariaski by adding a rigid body rotation, you get the correct orientation relationship and the mechanism of transformation can be displacive, consistent with the temperatures at which these reactions happen. And of course, there are transition carbides as well. So epsilon carbide, for example, uh, it sometimes precedes cementite if the carbon concentration is sufficiently large. And we know the orientation relationship between the uh, epsilon and the ferrite. So this is a, a 110 plane of uh, ferrite, and this is the unit cell of epsilon. So we can work out a correspondence matrix. We have the complete tool, the orientation and the correspondence matrix. And here are the calculations that I did. We show that it's impossible to get a displacive transformation. So that's a puzzle because epsilon forms at the same temperature as the cementite during the tempering reaction. So why does it form in thin plates when diffusion of ion atoms is not really a possibility at all? And yet we cannot find any of the eigenvalues to be one. The answer lies in some atom probe work which was done in Oxford uh, quite a long time ago. I think Alfred Cerezo is online at the moment and he might recognize this image. These are not carbides. This is the clustering of carbon, the oriented clustering of carbon that takes place before the epsilon carbide precipitation reaction. Now, what that means is that the lattice parameter locally increases because carbon increases the lattice parameter. And when I did a calculation allowing for an increase in the lattice parameter of the supersaturated ferrite, you not only recover this invariant line, but you can show that this line actually lies in the habit plane of the epsilon carbide. So all is well. Uh, the question of why you get the clustering of carbon and why it is an oriented clustering is answered in uh, uh, the paper that I referred to here by Zhu uh, Cerezo and George Smith. Okay, uh, eta carbide, which is also a transition carbide that was shown uh, many, many years ago by uh, Taylor and uh, Greg Olson and Morris Cohen, to be completely consistent with a displacive transformation mechanism. And this is the shear strain and the volume change is really quite large uh, because of the crystal structure of uh, eta carbides. So all of these carbides happily form by a displacive transformation mechanism. And this is a beautiful image. I really like it because it also shows this uh, uh, very fine tip that you have, which is a characteristic of displacive transformation which allows the plate to be elastically accommodated inside the matrix. Now, in the case of uh, uh, nitrides, uh, it is also possible to find an invariant line. Okay, this is a body-centered cubic uh, type nitride. And you can see that the shape is truly of a plate, thin plate. So this is just looking at the habit plane on uh, in a plan view. Now, my next slide uh, is about deformation-induced martensitic transformation of carbides. Okay, now you might imagine this is really crazy, but in the course of um, my uh, researching uh, for a book, I discovered one single paper, courtesy of Google Scholar, on the martensitic transformation of titanium carbide. So these, this is electron microscopy, showing you know fault like images okay but the authors were clever enough to investigate these faults in in great detail and what they are is a sequence of two martensitic transformations so first you get what they call a quad quad like uh, uh, martensite here which is rhombohedral and just four layer thick and then the transformation progresses with twin related uh, layers of martensite which have a different uh, total symmetry. And you get this transformation from cubic to rhombohedral. This is the four layer thick region. 
And if you put uh, the twin related four layers next to those four layers, then the whole thing is described as a hexagonal multi transformation. And it fits so nicely with the crystallographic theory, even though this shear strain is enormous. Okay, this is a this is greater than the shear strain in twinning. Okay, so this is the largest uh, shear strain that I have found in the case of martensite, and a volume contraction normal to the habit plane. Now, this isn't the only deformation induced carbide transformation. Uh, it's well known, very well known, that cementite, when you uh, cementite when present in ferrite and you deform the system severely, the cementite will tend to dissolve. So here are some uh, experimental data on the drawing of politic wires. Uh, these are simply the transformation temperatures at which the wires were produced. So this would give fine perlite, this would give coarse perlite. And you can see that the fraction of cementite quantitatively measured using MOS power spectroscopy uh, decreases with the drawing strains. So here I have a measure of, you know, the amount of cementite that has disappeared into the ferrite, uh, completely dissolved, and the carbon has gone into a supersaturated ferrite as a function of drawing strain. What I need in order to do a calculation is, uh, uh, is also the dislocation density. But before that, I'll show you how this dissolution looks like in the atom probe. So, you know, uh, if you think that uh, the cementite has a composition of 25 atomic percent, this is at a very late stage of the dissolution process. You can see that there are regions near the cementite particle, the original cementite particle, with a, a very widespread distribution of carbon. So this is a real effect that the cementite is actually dissolving in the ferrite. And the reason why it's dissolving uh, goes back to the days of Cottrell, uh, who was addressing a different problem, but he showed that carbon present at dislocations has a lower energy than carbon in cementite. And this was, of course, developed uh, later by Kalish and Cohen, and I'll come to that in a minute. So the simple reason about why cementite goes into solution when you deform heavily is that there is an increase in dislocation density in the ferrite, and the carbon becomes more stable inside the dislocations than in cementite. So I found uh, uh, data for the dislocation density as a function of the drawing strain. So these are transmission electron microscopy measurements of the dislocation density. And using that and the theory by Kalish and Cohen on how much uh, carbon a uh, uh, dislocation can hold, so NC is simply the number of carbon atoms that you recognize in a single plane uh, threaded by the dislocation. So obviously, if, if there's a lot more of carbon atoms associated with the dislocation, then you'll be able to dissolve much greater concentrations of carbon. Now, I need to know what number to pick. And of course, I can refer again to uh, data from, uh, sorry, data from uh, the atom probe, the classic work that uh, George Smith and uh, Alfred and um, another person whose name I forget did to image the carbon atmosphere around dislocations. And they came up with a number of 21, which, which kind of fits with uh, the strain fields around dislocations. And when I do the calculation for the data that I illustrated earlier, it nicely explains cementite that went into solution. So this is a deformation induced transformation of cementite into supersaturated ferrite. Uh, it's not martensitic, uh, even though there is one paper uh, from the Max Planck Institute which claims martensitic transformation. It's simply the dissolution of carbon at dislocations. Now, Going to substitutionally alloyed carbides, you know, which are rich in substitutional alloying elements, there's no possibility of them forming by a displacive transformation mechanism. And this is an analysis I did from the atom probe work by Stark and Smith, which shows that the trend in particle size that they observed is similar to the trend uh, 
with a very rough uh, calculation of the diffusion distance of molybdenum atoms. So without the ability for these atoms to diffuse, uh, these carbides simply would not form. And I think Roger mentioned it in his talk, but um, basically you can rule out substitutional atom diffusion below about this temperature range in typical heat treatments. So if I do some calculations in a similar way to uh, how I explained it earlier, that I uh, get an orientation relationship, which is in the literature, and I um, work out a correspondence matrix, uh, there is absolutely no invariant line. And furthermore, these distortions are really huge, especially along these two vectors. Okay. Now, the reason why I have hexagonal and orthorhombic is because uh, if the composition of the molybdenum carbide is somewhat different, then it has uh, an orthorhombic that is rather than hexagonal. But these two are fairly similar uh, if you plot your crystal structures. So the conclusion here is that it's impossible to get a displacive transformation. Of course, we knew that because you would require substitutional atom diffusion, but we can still use this information. What this shows is that the strain fields, you know, if you if you actually had a coherent particle, the strain fields along these directions would be intolerable at any observable size. And this is the reason why molybdenum carbide in steels forms as needles. So uh, we are looking here at a 0, 0, 001 direction of ferrite going through the plane of the diagram. So these are the two orthogonal variants of um, molybdenum carbide, and these are the needles poking out from the plane of the diagram. Okay. So these are truly in the form of needles along the direction where we have the minimum uh, deformation to change the ferrite into the molybdenum carbide. So you can explain the shape of a diffusionally formed uh, carbide simply by looking at these deformations required, even though they are hypothetical deformations. Now, just to prove this, uh, I did a search in the literature and uh, one of my former students, uh, Joe Robson and his team, have been working on uh, uh, graphene uh, formed, uh, formed on uh, liquid copper that is in a molybdenum uh, crucible and they accidentally formed uh, molybdenum carbide, which is not at all like a needle, okay? So this is unconstrained molybdenum carbide. You can see that this is not at all needle shaped because it doesn't have a surrounding ferrite matrix. And this is another, another example from a different uh, study where molybdenum carbide is faceted hexagonally but is not forming as needles. So it's entirely the constraint of the ferrite which is giving us the needle shape. If you go to vanadium carbide, which also cannot form by a displacing mechanism, uh, we often say it's V4C3, but actually it's V6C5 uh, with a monoclinic crystal structure because uh, there is ordering of vacancies on the carbon atom sites. But let's say we are just interested in the substitutional lattice, then we can approximate it as, as this um, uh, cubic F lattice. So these are the lattice points of the vanadium carbide, and this is the ferrite with a much smaller cubic unit cell. So if I want to distort the ferrite into the vanadium carbide, I, to, I would have to expand it along all three directions because the lattice parameter of ferrite is uh, 0 0.2867, okay? So this would be the expansions that I would have to implement. And you notice that one of these eigenvalues, which is along here, is much greater than along the other two axes. So this immediately suggests that we should get a plate-shaped vanadium carbide, which forms by a diffusional mechanism, and that's exactly what you see. Okay, these are. Uh, this is a plan view of a precipitate, uh, which which is uh, whose normal is along the normal to the diagram. What it also says is that. You know, uh, you will only get coherency strains when these particles are small. Okay, uh, as soon as they coarsen, uh, you cannot tolerate the sort of distortions that I outlined in the previous slide, and you lose the coherency strains. Uh, 
Now, why is this important? Well, you know, a, a lot of us have been developing steels which resist hydrogen, okay? And they, it's only diffusible hydrogen that embrittles. And the reason is, you know, the hydrogen concentration is so ridiculously small in the steel that when you form a crack, the hydrogen has to diffuse to the tip of the crack and concentrate in order to embrittle the steel. You know, one part per million isn't going to embrittle hydrogen if it doesn't diffuse. You know, if I have a steel containing one part per million, it's there forever without any cracking if, uh, if, there, are, if there is no stress applied. Uh, in other words, if there is no crack and a stress. It's only the focusing of hydrogen at the crack tip which leads to embrittlement. So if we can trap the hydrogen atoms in the coherency strain fields of these particles, then you can develop really nice steels. Uh, so this is a, a thermal desorption spectroscopy showing uh, Steve Oy's work, where we, we developed a steel for the petroleum industry uh, where it is able to trap large quantities of hydrogen and yet have a bank of other properties which you need for such applications, toughness, weldability, large scale manufacture, et cetera, et cetera. And we do this by using vanadium, but also molybdenum because you can adjust the lattice parameter of the vanadium carbide by alloying it with molybdenum so that the coherency strain field is just right. This is fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic development done with the BP ICAM project, uh, collaboration with uh, Manchester University, who did the most severe hydrogen uh, um, embrittlement experiments imaginable and demonstrated that even with the superior properties that we have compared with normal steel that is used, uh, it is able to resist hydrogen embrittlement. Okay. Now, of course, uh, I mentioned to you that um, vanadium carbide has a cubic F structure approximately. And austenite also has a cubic F structure with a lattice parameter that is, you know, not as far from that of vanadium carbide as ferrite. So the shape that we expect is, uh, is uh, octahedral, and as it grows, it'll be like a, a Kelvin's uh, tetrachi decahedron. And that's exactly what you see when you form vanadium carbide in austenite, okay? Because there is a uniform expansion in all directions, but it's a small expansion compared with uh, the sort of features that we have for vanadium carbide in ferrite. And if I form vanadium carbide from liquid, then of course the shape is completely uh, resembling its the symmetry of its uh, crystal structure because it's completely unconstrained. Uh, there's no solid matrix around it. I'm going to finish now on a puzzle just like Roger did. And this is a puzzle. Uh, I think some of you in the audience will recognize this, uh, Rongchan Chen and uh, Ram Padamana. Uh, but it's a puzzle that has been irritating me a lot. Okay. And that is that when you take a steel, uh, Rampa Damana provided me these, uh, with these micrographs, but there are other studies in the literature and also reported in my book, uh, where we apply electrical pulses, not just to nanostructured bainite, but to perlite, et cetera. And you know, the total duration of the pulsing was uh, less than a millisecond. And the structure changes completely into this okay so this is a real effect so we've got a change from a mixture of ferrite and austenite to cementite particles form okay. apparently in milliseconds and rongchen chin claims and others claim that this is not a heating effect now what i would argue is that look uh, this is again from rampa damana uh, this, these particles have formed by electropulsing. This is an image that I took by severely tempering the same sort of microstructure. And the shape of these particles is all wrong for forming by a displacive transformation mechanism. And if you truly form these particles at ambient conditions with this sort of a time period, there's no way you can form them by the diffusion of the 
ion atoms. It's just impossible. You can do a very simple calculation which will show the diffusion distance is ridiculously small. Okay. Now, this is just a discrepancy. But what is more worrying is that all the theory that has been developed for this process simply doesn't have any closure with experiment in any quantitative way, which is what uh, you know Roger explained in his lecture as well. So it's all very well to talk about electron wind effects and so forth and so on. But the next step in electropulsing work should be in trying to make the theory a quantitative explanation of the structural change that we see. Now, many of the dis uh, things that I've described, including the electropulsing, are in my latest book, Theory of Transformations in Steels. But the crystallographic methods are in this book, which you can download freely from the web. And I'd like to finish by thanking a, a few people. So these are the key people who organized this against my will initially, but I'm really glad that they did it. Uh, and uh, obviously this is Adriel Wong, and this is uh, Dominic Jacek, and Steve Uy, the A-team. Uh, these are all the speakers, okay, wonderful speakers that participated in this talk, and, uh, you know, really exciting presentations, uh, which we have been able to record, and we'll be putting them onto our, our website, uh, onto YouTube. So thank you all very, very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, uh, we have a question from Dr. Suresh Babu. Uh, in the electron pulse, is it possible that the localized temperature at the phase boundaries may increase and not the bulk? I mean, that is one of, uh, one of the explanations. Uh, Mana in his paper, uh, talks about that. But um, my problem is that we need some quantitative theory, okay? Because those are all uh, sort of hand-waving explanations. There are some equations, but they are not actually applied. Thank you, Harry. Uh, a question from Francisca. Uh, is there any relation between carbon clustering and carbon segregation on dislocations? So um, the clustering, if you strictly think about it, clustering occurs because of the thermodynamics of the solution. You know, so in principle, it's independent from the segregation of carbon to defects. Okay. Right, I, I have a question uh, myself, uh, not, not related to carbides, but uh, this is coming from previous talks where someone asked, can you comment on what are some of the unresolved issues in steel metallurgy, uh, if you could provide some? Yeah, so I often get asked this question, and my answer is that they have to come from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> okay. Uh, what about ordering uh, from Francisca? Yes, uh, if you if you look at Alfred's uh, Alfred and Joe Smith uh, and uh, uh, Zhu's paper, then the reason for the oriented ordering is explained in there uh, in terms of uh, the elastic coherency strains once you start get the process started. Okay, Harry, I think we ran out of questions. Um. <laughs> uh, so thank you all very very much indeed. Uh, and uh, this might be the last time I thank you all because, you know, we have to stop the retirement celebrations now, <laughs> okay? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Harry. Yep. Okay. Bye-bye.